as a lot of people know that my favorite topic as of late uh, is the Mandela effect, which I think is the biggest thing to ever happen. And, uh, you know, I know that you said you wanted to get into this. So why don't you uh, tell me when your first introduction to the topic was, what it was, and then when you uh, started to take it seriously, because, you know, usually we kind of go through a few stages of it. Yeah, yeah. So firstly, the reason I like the Mandela Effect topic so much is it really is the ultimate test of are you going to define yourself by your own divinity, your own sovereignty, your own mental capacity? Are you going to define yourself by that or by what the system tells you? Mm -hmm. Because you have to make a choice, Brian, because everybody's Mandela affected. Yep. Everybody's Mandela affected. Now, what they do with that, that's the choice. And that's why I love it so much. Because once you realize that it was always a beautiful day in this neighborhood, and you know every day when you sat there and watched Mr. Rogers, you know it said it was always a beautiful day in the neighborhood. When you know that, and you're faced, it's like what I was talking about before with the splitting, how people split their personalities, and mm -hmm. they psychically make a split, because you're faced with the decision at that moment. Now, you could lie to the world, that's one thing. But once you start lying to yourself, yep. that's insanity. That's why I, it's so, it's so mind-boggling to me that people will go there and just throw all their experiences and everything away like that. Yeah. That's why it's the reason I love Mandela Effect so much because, you know, it's, it's the perfect test of saying, well, I see the evidence that this thing is happening. I may not understand the mechanism behind it. I may not even be able to grasp what that mechanism is, but I see the evidence, and the evidence can't be ignored, right? So, yet, yet the large majority of the so-called uh, truth movement does ignore it, dismiss it, mock it, ridicule it, try and laugh and make jokes at people like me and others that cover. So here's it. how I look at it now. You know, Brian. I used to get real angry about that, but here's where I am now with it. We all make our deals in this world, right? This world is a world of duality, right? We all have to make our little deals, our little contracts with the, with the reality, right? We all have to make our little contracts. And I think they made theirs. So without mentioning names, if you have a big channel and you're really big on a particular subject, say Flat Earth, and you're faced with this Mandela effect, you have a choice to make how you're going to present that, right? So we all make our deals, Brian. And, they, you know, so I don't blame them for making their deals. I don't blame them. We all do it. We all do it. So, and they serve a purpose, you know. Um, I love Dave Weiss, but he was on here. And, and, and at least he had the balls to come on and tell you he didn't believe in the Mandela effect, you know. Because if you're Dave Weiss... And I, 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 he's one of my favorite people, honestly. I've never met him, but I love his attitude. I love his everything. But I'm using him as an example because I have no ill will towards him. Because if you're Dave Weiss, you're the flat earth guy, right? So if he has to make the deal to deny it publicly, even if he knows it's true, I don't blame him for that anymore. And I used to be angry about it a couple months ago. So... You understand what I'm saying, Brian? So, so if he needs to make that deal to be the flat earth guy, to not scare people away, right? But it's interesting because people will make the deals, but yet they'll, they'll go right into Tataria and right into mud floods and yeah. you know, say reality might have been created in 1850, which it, it might have been. I'm not saying it, but I'm saying, like, why grasp that, you know? You know, or like, you know, melted bricks or giant trees and, you know, tree mountains and shit and all that stuff, which is cool. I'm into that stuff, too. But, like, it's weird. Like, you know, or I saw on another particular YouTubers, you know, and I didn't mean to use David. Like, I just I love David so much. But my point is that, like, if he has to make that deal, I don't blame him. Right. 
just to, just to keep some kind of credibility to the normies to get them into truth. Or but another big flat Earth channel who who is a, a vocal, outspoken denier. But they'll do like shows on like you know weird supernatural stuff. And I'm way into the supernatural, right? But you know what I'm saying? It's like they'll do a show on like astral projection or psychic kinesis or whatever, right? But but they'll still deny the Mandela effect. Yeah. So it's interesting. Very but I used to be really angry about it, dude. I used to be, dude. I used to be, like, I would even say four months ago, it used to piss me off because I thought there were sellouts. But maybe we're all sellouts a little bit, Brian. Like I said, we all make our deals. You have to make deals in this world. It's not a pure world. It's not. And they made theirs there. That's where they drew their line. So they're missing out. So they're, they're missing out on it. But yeah, that's. I don't want to say any more about all. I just. I wanted to say it out about people, but I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. But yeah, dude. So that's the question, Brian. Are they lying to themselves? You could lie to the world. You can tell the world you don't believe in the mental effect because you don't want to look stupid. Here's the thing, man. You know how it is. It's like we said. Is it a sacrifice? You, once you take certain stances, there's no coming back from it, right? It's so, so it's so it's so blatantly obvious though when these people deny it, they look fucking stupid. I mean, I spent and I'm not doing it anymore, but I spent a good part of four years showing how everybody is Mandela affected, including all the big name truthers and everything. And uh, I, I mean, I get everybody's what you're saying. Mandela affected. I, I look at it different, and I'm I'm not even interested in pointing out any any of these people anymore. It's a fucking complete waste of my time at this point. I made my point to the whole truth community. They can see it now, and we've got so many good people in the chat. That was more my goal, anyways. Wake the people up, and, and, and not so much wake the content creators up. It was to to get them so that their people would take it seriously. But we've got we've got the people that are going to be on board now. I think. Um, but at the same time, I'm extremely disappointed. Uh, you might not be, but I'm, I, this, I mean, this isn't my interview, but you know how I feel. And, and, and if, if I'm not going to engage and point, if I'm not going to point out these people or try to engage them or anything, I can just say this. I, I really have a hard time taking any Mandela effect denier seriously. And I hear, and, and uh, you know, I hear a lot of other channels, channels that you haven't mentioned. Oh, they'll, they'll take shots at me and, and the Mandela effect, and it's like, I think you guys are a joke. I mean, yeah, you guys can point out fakery forever. We know all that shit's fake. We've known it for a long time. It's far from impressive anymore. Um, I think what's really the most phenomenal thing is that you would deny the fucking nose on your own face if somebody, if, if, if reality told you it, it wasn't there. Like, it's fucking absolutely absurd. I mean, all of these people, endless Mandela effects coming out their mouth, because they live in this fucking reality with us. They're literally denying their own reality. Like, we've learned through the, some of the journeys we went through, especially like with Flat Earth, right? What did we learn? Well, they're hiding the supernatural, and we need to trust our own observations, experience, and senses. And then when it comes to the Mandela Effect, everybody does a fucking 180, tucks their tail through their legs, and fucking runs and hides. So I've got, I've got a take on it, ready? You remember the whole – I'll bring up a name, Owen Benjamin, who I like a lot. You know, he originally came out, and he was all about the Mandela effect, you know, with like a – what was it? Columbu, Columbu and all that stuff, remember? And feel, and feel, and feel the dreams, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's my point. He made a very telling statement that stuck with me when he was doing the feel the dream stuff, when he, when he kind of flip-flopped and, you know, when he was denying the Mandela effect and kind of – trying to excuse the field of dreams thing. He said something, Brian, that was a window into the psyche. He said, well, I can't accept, I'm going to paraphrase, but I don't remember exactly, but he basically said, I can't accept a fluid reality because what happens, I wake up one morning and I forget that my wife's my wife and my kids are my kids. And that's when I said, I said, oh, this is a psychological thing. See, he's invested, right? So he has a family. He has a family to take care of. He has this wife and kids. So his mind, his conception is that and it's a fear, right? It's a defense mechanism because if he submits to a fluid reality, then that thing that he needs to hold on to, mm -hmm. he's afraid he might lose that in that fluid reality, which isn't, wouldn't happen. But that's the rationalization. Do you understand what I'm saying, dude? It's like... I heard him say it. He says, he said it quickly. He's like, what, what if I wake up one morning and I forget my wife's my wife? And I said, oh, I get it. 
you're kind of projecting psychically or psychologically out because in your head you can't grasp you uh, honestly because i don't think they could handle the concept of a fluid reality you know it's scary brian my first my first mandela effect freaked me out dude i had like a almost a nervous breakdown what was it you know mentally like you know mentally it was the JFK thing, you know. Yeah. People go back and forth. Some people say there was always six people, you know. But I used to study the JFK thing, man. It was one of my first forays into truth, you know, was coming out. And when the car changed, it blew my mind. Like, it was like I was saying before, my flat earth moment, realizing that an elliptical or orbit's crazy. But when, it, when the JFK thing, because I had studied the JFK thing, and then when I noticed the car was completely different, and it wasn't so much that I remembered how many um, uh, seats there were, your rows, you know, how there's three rows now and six people. That wasn't what got me. It's the, the um, second windshield that's in front of his face. You know, it's like there's a second windshield in between, like right in front of him, in between the second and third rows. There's like a panel, glass or whatever it is. It was never there. Because how would it be? I always remember thinking, oh, if he's on the grassy knoll up there, how would he get through? So that was the one that got me. The second one that got me, Brian, was uh, Jaws. We're going to yeah. need a bigger boat. Yeah. I remember I was watching Jaws, and this is before I knew what the Mandela effect was. So, which means I probably saw it first and then only realized it was the Mandela effect after I was watching it. And I heard Chief Brody, when that part where Chief Brody says, he, and now he, he, I was watching it, and he goes, you know, the, he sees the shark, and he looks over to Quinn. I love the movie Jaws. It's a great movie, Jaws. I've seen it a million times. And he looks over to Quinn and says, you're going to need a bigger boat. And I went, what? You're going to – remember, it just stuck. But I didn't think too much of it. I was like, that sounded weird. You're going to need a bigger boat. I'm like, what the fuck is he talking – I'm like – in my head, I'm like, I'm like well, how would he say you're going to need a bigger boat? He's in the – they're all in this together, right? It doesn't make any sense. There's three guys on this mission to take down this shark, he's the hero. He's Chief Brody, you know? And he turns to Quinn and says, you're going to need a bigger boat. And it stuck out to me, but I didn't know what it was, right? So then the JFK thing. But I came across all of it through uh, – I was into uh, – what's his name? Matt from Quantum of Conscious. He, he's actually the YouTuber I've been with the longest. I've been with Matt. I watch every one of his videos and since – he started, he used to have a channel called Texas Shrugged, and I started watching him on Quantum Con. So he was the one who first started talking about Mandela Effect. And I started absorbing it and everything, and it was, you know, I didn't really take it in until I started looking into it, and I saw how many there were, and I realized this isn't my memory. There's too many, Yeah. you know. All you really need is one anchor memory. If you have an anchor, if you have something that's an anchor, and I have three of them, once you see that, that's all that matters. You just need one. There's nobody. I you mean, know, I, you're I, not going to tell me that I don't know what the Volkswagen logo looked like on the back of my car. You can go fuck yourself with this missed memory shit. Seriously, these people, yeah. these Mandela effect deniers, you guys are fucking clowns, dude. Seriously. Yeah. And again, there's people that are going right. to disagree on certain Mandela effects, right? Um, but then when we get into a deeper discussion of this, which we will, and how this reality actually works, we're kind of all in our own individual reality. We're not even all affected by the same one. So however that fits in, you know, whether it's a frequency-based reality, we're all perceiving it almost the same time, but not always the same. There's a lot of things that, that come into it. But to say that there's no real Mandela effects, reality's not changing, in 2022, you really do look like a clown, at least to me. But continue. Yeah, dude. Well, that's why, Brian, that's why I was... <clears throat> In that uh, on that panel that we were on the other night, that's why I was so hard on that guy about stupid quantum shit, because I was trying to, you know, um, when you're trapped in a quantum world, when you're trapped in a world of particles, this particle physics that they present to us, which is a kindergarten physics, anyway, mm -hmm. when you're trapped in that world, you're going to see things a certain way, but once you realize that likely. This whole reality that we experience is consciousness, okay? I said this in one of my videos <clears throat> not long ago, is we have this conception that humans have consciousness, right? So when you live in an ever-expanding universe where, where we evolved from amoebas, there's this presented to us that at a certain point along our history of evolution that we, as humanity, emerged consciousness, that it sprung out of this evolution, 
But in essence, I don't see it that way at all. I see consciousness as the overarching reality. And I see the physical reality that we experience as just a part of that. Like you said, probably a frequency. You know, if you see this, this reality as a consciousness spectrum, um, a spectrum of frequency, the reality that we experience is some sort of dimension probably. So once you look at the reality as consciousness, said we don't have consciousness, we are consciousness. And uh, the barriers dissolve. And, and, and all the ancients, if you look at the different ancient cultures, they all allude to this kind of thing. People call it New Age, Brian. It's not New Age. They call it New Age because they're, you know, they have the Bible and they have what they're indoctrinated into. New Age concepts are older and predate the Bible by a long, long shot. Okay? When you look at the old Hindu and Vedic writings of what this reality is, when you look at the ancient Sumerians and all these cultures that predate the Judeo Christian uh, uh, doctrines and orthodoxy, these cultures predate them by thousands of years. If you buy into the history that we're given, you know, we don't have to. I don't, but if this is take history as it's presented, these quote unquote new age concepts <clears throat> of consciousness are anything but new age. They predate all the all the biblical uh scriptures. So anyway, so when you look at this reality as consciousness, all right, and everything we see as consciousness, well, the Mandela effect makes perfect sense. All right. They're trying to tell us it's a simulation. They want to point to CERN. They want to point to we're in some simulation. Okay, well, if you want to use simulation as just a synonym for God or consciousness, okay. But if you're trying to tell me we're in a simulation where basically we're a computer programmer or, or not, I'm not buying that, right? Me neither. Me neither. This is what they want to do. They're going to bring everything back to the particle world. They're going to start talking about quantum mechanics, quantum computing, D-wave computers. Yep. This is bullshit, dude. That's what they're going to take us. So they're at CERN, it's quantum, and they're smashing. Like that guy the other night, he was a smart guy, so indoctrinated, man. But, oh, well, CERN's doing this, and they're cr crashing particles and God particle and quantum entanglement with it's electrons crazy. and everything. They black holes. Keep... He was throwing out there black holes that they were making with CERN. And yeah. I was like, wow, this is good. Brian, I loved dismantling him systematically just with questions. Because once you apply any degree of logic and reasoning, they fall apart. And you don't even have to say anything, dude. You just have to ask them questions and lead them down a track of logic. And and quickly, if they're if they have any degree of intelligence, you you can see them. They'll they'll hit, they'll hit it. They'll hit like um like a brick wall in their logic, and they can't go any further. So, and you'll watch them roll over, or they'll react violently or aggressively. It's interesting. But um, what the fuck was I saying? So yeah, consciousness, dude. So uh, what they want to do is they'll they'll try to keep us in this particle world. No, it's it's Einsteinian bullshit. This and it's 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 uh, Einstein Rosen bridges and wormholes and yeah, and, 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 it's and, nonsense. And, and, you know, yeah. it's keeping us in their lives, which right. is what I say. I feel that the, I I honestly feel that any content creator that knows the Mandela effect is real, but is telling people it's not. They're totally keeping people in the lie of the physical matrix, whether they tell people the Earth is flat and events on TV are fake or not. I mean, that's just unfathomable to me. Um, right, because that's yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Well, it goes down to the fundamental concept of what this reality is. Do you, do you really Brian, want to know the truth? Are we really trying to figure out what this place is if we deny the Mandela effect? I mean, are you fucking kidding me? Absolutely not. <laughs> well, Brian, the Mandela effect, I'm going to say it, dude. It proves God, if you yeah. really want to get down to it. Yeah, dude. It proves God because God, it, God, God's a concept, right? Because if, if, if this is all consciousness, it's just God, right? Whatever God, whatever you think God is, it's just what it is, right? So, so that maybe they can't face God because when you when you inter when you have to face that there's truly a God, a concept of a God, you have to truly face that there's morals, principles. You have to face that there's actually a right and wrong, not just some morally ambiguous, culturally influenced right and wrong. An actual right and wrong. We may not know what it is, but right and wrong exists in the absolute, in a world of consciousness, in a world of God. But so to admit. There's, there's, to admit that yeah. this is consciousness, yeah, dude, they, you have to admit yeah. that there's God. And now you are accountable. Once you admit there's a God, you're accountable for what you do. So, go ahead. No, I mean, you, you're spot on with that. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we go into your list of 20, but like, let's really meticulously look at each one because uh, 
you know, let's put that's what I wanted to do. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. And you're uh, going to yeah, this. I'm just going to shut the camera off for one second. I have my headphones. I'm just stepping to the bathroom to pee, but you can start on your first one. We don't need a break or anything. I'll be back in 60 seconds, but I'm listening. All right. All right. This is going to be fun. So I'm going to go in descending order, right? So I ranked them into my most progressively stronger effects. All right. So first honorable mention because I had two that I couldn't fit in. Dark Side of the Moon. All right. I just came across this one. I didn't realize this one, but now it's, it's apparently always been the Dark Side of the Moon. But I don't remember that. Dark Side of the Moon, Brian, was one of my favorite albums when I was in college. 1997. My second year of college, maybe. Um, I used to listen to Dark Side of the Moon going to bed every single night. I loved the album. Right? It was always Dark Side of the Moon. Dark Side of the Moon. Everything. Commercials. Thing. But now all of a sudden it's always been the Dark Side of the Moon. The reason it didn't make my list is because I haven't looked into it enough to substantially stand behind it, right? So that's why I put it on there. Now, this that could easily be in my top ten yeah. if I substantiate it more. Right? I've, tri I've, tri I've triggered some deniers with that one. Some deniers? Oh, yeah, I've triggered them. Why, because, because, because they know it was Dark Side of the Moon. Oh, because they know it was Dark Side of the Moon, but they won't accept the Mandela effect no matter what, so they get triggered at, mad at me. <laughs> I'm not the one changing your fucking reality. Hey, maybe we're all changing it together, but I'm not specifically changing this and uh, trolling you. It, it, reality's changing it. it I, I just, man... Uh, Brian, it's, it's, in, nine, in the 1990s, Pink Floyd was still huge, dude. Huge. Mm -hmm. I was in college. Everybody loved Pink Floyd. They were awesome. You take a couple bong rips and you put on Dark Side of the Moon, yeah. you know? And you just – everybody knew it. I could remember every other dorm room had the poster and a yeah. fucking thing. Dude, I remember the posters. I remember going to record stores. There was always Dark Side of the Moon, Dark Side of the Moon. There was no the. No. So – it, it, that's Dark Side of the Moon is one of the hugest albums ever. It was a breakthrough album, like 1972, 1971. It was one of the first albums to employ computer technology, Brian. It was one of the first albums where they used like synthesizers and digital technology yeah. in the recording and producing process. It was a monumental album. Okay. Everybody knows it was Dark Side of the Moon. But the reason it didn't make my list is because... I haven't really looked into this. Yeah, it's a legit one. I looked into it a few years ago, and there, the it is one that there is some uh, UK releases where you can still find uh, written the old way on some of the the uh, releases. But at least all the ones in the United States for sure are all the dark side of the moon. <clears throat> okay. The second and last honorable mention is if you build it, they will come. Love it. The only reason it didn't make my. And the reason it didn't make my list was because I was kind of young when the movie came out, Field of Dreams. I remember if you build it, they will come. But I can't definitively in my mind separate it because I was like – I liked Wayne's World and stuff or the parodies mm -hmm. where they said if you – so I can't definitively pin a memory of if you build it, they will come. You see what I'm saying? It's a vague memory. I know it's there. Yeah. But because of some of the parodies, I can't definitively say – Yeah. That I know that one's 100%. But in my mind, it was if you build it, they will come. And I know there's like two parts of the movie where they say it, but in this reality, they was never said. It was always he yeah. will come. You know? Um, and it begs the question why do all the parodies say they? And every That's time, thing, Brian, all the parodies, and even now when they're going to do the baseball game out in Iowa, all the announcers and all the articles that are coming out, if you build it, they will come, if you build it, they will come, if you build it, they will come. <clears throat> yeah, dude. So the thing about the Mandela effect is if we all have these bad memories, which is funny because some of the smartest, most intelligent, brightest people that I've ever met are in this community. Yeah. But yeah, we all have these horrible memories. No. But we're all fucking geniuses, so explain it to me. Yeah. We had a bunch of geniuses sitting around they're, they're talking with these to fucking us horrible like, memories. They're talking to us just like the normies talk to us. Oh, you're so smart until you started saying this and that. You know, it's the same thing. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, oh, you're a flat earther. You're, John, you're always so fucking smart with all this other stuff, but you're just wrong in this one huge concept of what the reality actually is. Anyway. So, yeah, if you build it, they will come. 
dude, but we all and we we all have these bad memories, but yet not only are our memories bad, but our false memories are all the same. Yeah. Why not if you build it, she will come. Why not if you build it, you know, I don't know if it's now, it'd be they, them, Zer will come, dude. Whatever pronoun you want to use. But I remember they. And and let me add to this. Right. Not only do we all remember you know, the, those of us, you know, that are, you know, saying it's changed. Not only do we all remember the same word, they, when it could be you, it, whatever, right? Um, but on top of that, on every fucking one of these Mandela effects that you're probably going to go through on your list, and I haven't seen your list yet, on every Mandela effect that's on my 122 on my short list, if we went to a grocery store and locked the doors with 100 adults in there and asked them to fill in the blanks on any of these, we are the majority by a fucking long shot, like in the 90% on most of these fucking things. is what everybody in the world remembers. They're just going to deny the Mandela effect, brush it off or whatever. But I'm not going to – so there are going to be people that will say he will come. But if you ask the 100 people, you're going to get like 90 that say they, if not higher, dude. Exactly, dude. Exactly. All right. So number 20, working down, HIPAA, okay? Yeah, buddy. You, I just told you my background, Brian. I told you my background, okay? H-I-P-P-A, you know what it was in my world. Never was it. Now it's supposed to be H-I-P-A-A, apparently. Yep. Brian, do you know how many medical practitioners still are going to tell you it's two Ps? Oh, dude, I because mean. Because we all learned it is two Ps, bro. Even in the last few weeks, I mean, uh, somebody sent me their uh, their, their doctor's office, their letterhead. It's not the it's their own uh, version of writing HIPAA with their fonts on a letterhead, uh, you know, and they put H I P P A. And I watched my nurse, uh, uh, my first appointment after my surgery, and dude, I'm telling you, dude, again, like we're meant to see this and wake people up to this. Like I watched her literally like turn the monitor of the screen. So I could see her typing and watched her go H I P and then pause. And I thought she was going to take the update and she put P A and typed it on the computer. And like, come on, dude. And, and, and again, all the stuff you just said about COVID, the P that's missing from the acronym is the P that stood for privacy. And if people thought, and what happened to your health privacy when COVID started? I mean, come on, dude. Not important, though. This doesn't matter. None of this matters. Right. The two P's were portability and privacy. Mm -hmm. And they were both. Privacy was heavily uh, emphasized in my education when I learned about HIPAA. The privacy part was um, emphasized, Brian, but it yep. just disappeared. Yep. Gone. Yep. Gone from reality like it never fucking existed, like a fart in the wind. Yep. All right. Numbers 19. Sally Fields. That was her name, Sally Fields. Okay. Wasn't Sally Field? No. It was Sally Fields. All right. I remember being a kid. Sally Fields is weird, man. And the, the fact that she's involved with like Tom Cru uh, Tom Hanks, like in Forrest Gump, is a Mandela effect haven. Oh, dude. Yeah. Because not only yep. do you have the movie itself, okay, but you got Tom Hanks and his creepy weirdness, and the fact that they made him Mr. Rogers. So now every time I think about Mr. Rogers, I got to think about that fucking asshole. Yeah. Fuck you. Okay. But not only that. In Forrest Gump, you had him and you had Sally Fields. Yeah. So there's two things with her. One, now apparently it was never Sally Fields. It's always been Sally Field. I used to watch her when I was a kid. The young Sally Fields, she was, her first show was called Gidget. For anybody who's younger, you might not know that. She was Gidget. And I, it's a, she was kind of cute and stuff. You, know, you don't think of Sally Fields as being super cute, even though she kind of was like a female sex symbol uh, I don't know dude like I, think, late I, 70s, think early most, I think most guys thought of her as being super cute when she was younger for sure yeah like you know like Smokey and the Bandit she was in Smokey and the Bandit with, what's his name uh, Burt Reynolds yeah and, and she was I, I, oh by the way on, yeah, the back of, on, on Smokey and on the Bandit on the back of the VHS it still says Sally Fields with an S on that movie no shit oh so one of the biggest major movies that she was in Burt Reynolds at the time an iconic movie and they just fuck her name up yeah, yeah, and exactly. and Forrest Gump, they still have the original quote on that VHS, Life is like a box of chocolates on the back of the box, dude. But it's not in the movie. Yep. Nope. So she's a big one. And then the other thing besides her name is her her famous Oscar speech. Yeah. You know. Like we said, Brian, like we're not super old, but we're old enough to remember those times. 
You know, there wasn't like an internet when we were kids. There wasn't like all these cable channels. Cable didn't come out in my. We didn't get cable till I was like ten or twelve. So like, media was bigger. Hollywood was bigger back then, right? Everything was bigger because all eyes were on it. There wasn't all this multimedia to consume. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whenever they would show these Oscars clips and these montages, they would show her fawning, saying how you love me, you love, you really love me. Everybody knew it was love me. Well, now she never said love me, right? She said, like, you like me, no, but it's used, all different she now. Used to like, say, you she like used to me, say, now you like me. She used to say, you like me. You really like me. Now she says, you like me right now. now you like right me. now you like me. And it's a totally That's different it. inflection in it, too. And and not only do we have all these residue of people, there's a clip of her quoting it the old way herself in an interview, dude. Herself. Like, right out of her own mouth, dude. Talking about her famous quote. You like me. Right now, you like me. It's phenomenal, dude. Yeah, remember, that was iconic. Her kind of fawning all over the Oscar stage, you know, Academy Award. She's crying. I don't remember which movie... She got her Oscar for. I don't remember which movie it was. I'm sure it wasn't Smokey and the Bandit. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't that. Um, who knows what the fuck it was for? But anyway, that's a big one. Number 18. Who Will Save Your Soul? Oh, dude, I love this. This, is, this might be my favorite music one, dude. This one's so ridiculous. I. I, uh, you know, not like I was a huge Jewel fan, but I did love that song, man, when that song was, was big. And uh, go ahead, man. This is your interview. You tell us why. Explain so, it to people, too. There's people that don't even know, you know, still. So. All right. So Jewel was pretty big singer. It was like the late 90s, Brian? Early yeah. 2000s, maybe? Late, late 90s, I think. Anyway, she was, you know, not only was her music cool, whatever. Like you said, it wasn't my music, but... She had that look that I liked, man. She kind of had that look where, you know, she kind of had that nut and crunchy granola look where she kind of looked natural, but she's real pretty. And, you know, you picture yourself kind of hanging out with her, and, you know, and in a log cabin, fire on. You know, I'm giving you my fantasy. Yeah, I was but just going to say, so uh, you were fantasizing about Jewel, okay. <laughs> right. I was in the Jewel, man. She had, like, her teeth weren't perfect. She had that one kind of, like, see, that's what I'm telling you. She had that one kind of, like, you know, a little snaggle tooth, but it, like, kind of looked good on her because she, you know, like the girl next door kind of look. And she had a laid-back vibe, and her music was real cool, you know. She was the kind of girl I was into, right? I said I lived in Vermont. Anyway, when she, that song came out, Who Will Save Your Soul? You could picture it. Yeah, who will save your soul? Well, now it's who will save your souls. There's an S on the end of it, a plural. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. It's not euphonious. It doesn't sound right in the song. And the thing about music is music, that's why mu music sticks the melody. The, the, something about music and, and a melody of music, your brain remembers that almost more than anything, right? And who will save your souls was not the song. And now all of a sudden it always was, so... For anybody, it was probably her biggest song, and she would just repeat this chorus over and over again. It was part of the chorus, Who Will Save Your Soul. You know, you'd be riding in the car, you'd be singing it or whatever. And just for the record, the, title, know, been... the title still says soul, but she says souls almost yeah. throughout the whole thing. Yeah, you're in your car riding and singing it. I might have been in my dorm room with the lights off under the covers singing it to Jewel. Who knows? But anyway, um, it was soul wasn't souls so some of the song ones are tough like i didn't put a cut like uh uh mamas and a papas mm -hmm. i got down on my knees and i began to pray apparently that's i pretend to pray yeah it wasn't pretend to pray dude no. i listened to mamas and papas since i was a kid man i'm way into music dude way into music man so the music ones are interesting because the significant residue well, with meaning. most of them. I mean, the Jewel one, I mean, we've got her several times singing it the old way in live performances. And also with the Mamas and the Papas, I mean, I, I, you, you would know these people's names better, but I did cover it in a video. The woman that wrote the song was questioned about why it says pretend to pray now. And she made up this crazy story that, oh, well, I wrote it as pretend to pray, but she went in the singer, whatever her name is. She went in the booth and sang it as began to pray. And his mama... Well, if you put it in now, Mama, it doesn't Mama say Mama that, Cass. though. That story doesn't jive because you put it in, it doesn't say began to pray. It says pretend to pray, just like the lyrics say now. 
pretend to pray. Um, her name's Mama Cats. Mama Cats. Um, there was another female singer too. I don't know if she's the one who wrote it. I forget her name. And there was the dudes. Yeah. Yeah, Mama Cass was the famous one. Um, what about uh, yeah, City of, what, what about Under the Bridge? Red Hot Chili Peppers. Oh, uh, City this, of Angels, right? Yeah. Angel yeah. and Angels. Yeah. Now he said it's it supposedly was always Angel. That doesn't even make sense, Brian. Dude, the entire video. Why would it be City the, of the Angel? Vi the video is shot in Los Angeles, dude. He's talking about the City of Angels. That song was huge, dude. <laughs> that was Red Hot Chili Peppers' first big hit, dude. Yeah. It came out. It was off the album Blood Sugar Sex Magic. I'll never forget it when it came out. Early 90s. It was a huge song. Everybody knows that song. I got. Uh, if he said City of Angel, I would know it. It would stick out. It didn't stick out. It makes no sense that he would leave the S off. And again, I got at least two performances I've shown in my city. of. I got a video on each one of these that we've talked about so far, by the way. Every Mandela effect we talked about, I have a short video on it. Um, but with the Red Hot Chili Peppers one, again, twice in concert I got on my video. And other people have shown it before me too, like Moneybags and others. So shout out to them. Um, but uh, them singing in concert along with like 100,000 people at Lollapalooza or something, all singing with the band City of Angels. But yes, dude, it's, it's so ridiculous. Continue, though. It's complete. <laughs> yeah, it's completely not. Well, think about it. And the name of that album, Brian, is Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Blood yeah. Magic, all that Alistair Crawley shit and all that blood fucking dark magic they're into. Anyway. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> I want your take on this one, dude. I don't think I've ever heard you talk about this one. I'm sure you know about it. I, I just never heard you talk about it. And the number 17 on my list. Run, you fools. Oh, Run, I, you fools. is that what is that Harry Potter or something? No, close. Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I've never, I've never seen that except uh, we watched one of those movies like a week or two ago, me, Ted, and Karen, but I think it was... Uh, Harry Potter, yeah, that's what we watched one of those. Movies. Okay, so money. Never, I saw this one on Money Bags. Money Bags had one on this years ago. Yeah. So there's a part. It was the best part of the movie to me when I saw the movie where Gandalf is like the wizard, hero, protector of the whole Fellowship of the Ring. Is the first movie. And they're like running away from this huge fire demon. That's you know whatever. So there's this part where Gandalf kind of saves everybody, and he vanquishes the demon. And the demon's falling down this like never ending pit or whatever. But the demon has a whip in his hand and he whips it back up and pulls Gandalf the wizard down. So the point is now Gandalf's hanging on the precipice about to fall into this pit. And he looks at the rest of the fellowship members, you know, Frodo and all those other weirdos. And uh, he looks at him and he says, run, you fools. And I remember saying that in my head. And there's this part, his family, he goes, you shall not pass. I guarantee there's a bunch of people here who know exactly what I'm talking about. And he's like, you shall not pass. It's like the most iconic part of the movie. And then that part where he said, run, you fools, it always stuck with me. Now, it's always been fly, you fools. All right? But apparently, in the book, it was always fly, you fools. So that's what people say. Well, it was in the book, fly, you fools. I don't care if it was in the book. Because in the movie, he fucking said run. Yeah. He fucking said it. A lot of people, this is a big one for a lot of people, apparently. It's a big one for me, too. Because I remember, I used to love that part with Gandalf, because he stood up to his demon. And he's, it's so iconic. He says, run, you fools. Now he always says flies. It's weird. You see, he says flies and everything. Number 16. C-3PO's leg. Oh, buddy. Top five. <laughs> Top five for me. Continue. Okay. The reason I put it at 16 is because... As much as I love Star Wars, and I could picture C-3PO, the parts where the silver leg are prominent now, which is the beginning of A New Hope, which is episode four, which was the first movie. And then, Brian, remember that part? I'm sure you know about it. In uh, the Ewok village. Oh, dude, in, uh, when, he's in, when he's in the chariot, in, uh, it's ridiculous, yeah. That, that when they lift him up, where he levitates, right? That's where he levitates. I use, I use that in my thumbnail for my C-3PO videos, because that silver leg right there yeah, is exactly. ridiculous. Yeah, exactly. Okay, now, uh, that was uh, Return of the Jedi, the third one. Yeah. Uh, Return of the Jedi, even though that's not my favorite movie, favorite Star Wars movie, Empire Strikes Back is, but that's the one I know the best because 
when Star Wars came out, it was like 1978. I was just born. Hey, just but so you know, time, I know a lot of Star Wars fans would disagree. I actually like Return of the Jedi better than Empire Strikes Back. So I'm a Return of the Jedi guy. You're a Return of the Jedi guy? Oh, I'm, an emp- I'm an Empire guy. I'm an Empire. <laughs> I, I, I can't blame you for it. I mean, it's cool, you know? He takes oh, that, down Vader. I mean, we're like, moment, it's like, you know? you know, it's all neck and neck. But for me, I, I like I like a, a New Hope and Return of the Jedi actually better than Empire. But I do think, you know, Empire is like right there. I just, for some reason, dude, I know this is stupid. I never resonated with the Hoth scene and all the snow. I just didn't like that as a kid. I don't know why, dude. And I thought the Ewok oh, Village. Oh, weird. I thought the Ewok Village was such a cool scene and everything and that's mostly what it what it was for me and i don't know man it was just seeing luke come back as a jedi with a green lightsaber and he's fucking kicking ass and turning the jedi was like awesome dude well he's badass when he walks in when he walks into uh jabba's palace uh, jabba's yeah jabba's palace dude and he just he walks in and just starts taking over there's a mandela effect there too he throws a fucking skeleton now you see the skull you know what i'm talking about brian Oh yeah, I did a video on him throwing the skull at the bone. When he's fight, he's fighting the uh, rancor, whatever yeah. that thing's called, the rancor. Yeah, it used to be a rock, dude. He's yeah. when I was a kid, he just picked up and threw a rock. I would have known if it was a skull, Brian. I watched that movie a billion times. I would sit there and study it. There was nothing else. And now it's a skull. That's, it looks hey, so stupid. You that's see? definitely a Mandela effect. I covered it in a live stream. I thought I did a short video on it too, but I definitely covered it in a live stream. Definitely was a rock, dude. For the people that don't know, it's the scene where he's fighting the Rancor, and eventually what happens is he gets the door to come down and kill the Rancor's neck. But Luke is like underneath some rocks or whatever, a little ledge. He comes out, he goes over to a pile. And he grabs what used to be a stone and throws it at the button, and now it's a skull. Yeah, dude. I didn't. When did that? When did you notice that? I just found out about that like this past summer, like at the. Somebody I don't know. Some some channel had it. I don't know who it was. You know, it just came up, and it was like a short video, and I was like, no way, man. It wasn't a skull. It just wasn't. He picked up a rock and threw it. It's crazy, dude. Dude, that's a thing, man. Think about it. Uh, Star Wars is full of these effects. But C-3PO's leg is a big one for me, dude. Because when he levitated in that chair in Ewok Village, Mm -hmm. he just had his gold legs, man. There was no silver leg. When when I first saw the silver leg, Brian, I thought, oh, well, you know, Lucas redid the first three, and then he made the prequels, and then they made these new ones. Oh, maybe the silver leg came along. But no, dude. So that's why it took me a while to get on the silver leg, because there were so many remakes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I fortunately, I, dude, I, 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 you know, I, like you, are aware of the remakes and the Blu-ray releases and the CGI added at different times and all these different things. But I was sitting on three different copies of the trilogy uh, when I became aware of this because I had a, a physical VHS, I had a DVD uh, set that was the Blu-ray release. And I had actually two digital versions and one which was the actual theatrical release of them on my hard drive. So sure, people could say those hard drive ones could have got digitally altered somehow, but I had two different hard copy versions, uh, Silver Lake on all of them. You know, and no, don't give me that. It's a resolution issue. We never know what it's too. That's that that's and plus the residue I got right behind me, as we know. Uh, but that that scene in the Ewok Village was so iconic, dude. There's no way he had a silver leg there. It's such an eyesore. And what's funny is the gatekeeping for that one came out. This is why, again, they know that the Mandela effect is about to blow up. They started gatekeeping that as early as 2011, um, starting floating some things out there uh, to try and discredit that and say it's always been there and it's just been reflecting off the sand. Well, there's no sand in the fucking Ewok village, and there's no sand in the first scene of Star Wars A New Hope when he's on Princess Leia's ship before he even goes down to Tatooine. Right, the ship. It's one of the first scenes in the movie. First exactly. scene. Very first scene in the movie. So the idea yeah. that if something happened in Empire Strikes Back, oh, they blew him into pieces and Chewie put it back to... No, dude, that has nothing to do with anything. Silver, silver leg threw out, dude. And I will definitely agree with deniers and debunkers on one thing. Uh, in most cases, it, it, they'll say in all, but yeah, in most cases, it's very hard to tell. Uh, but it's not hard to tell in that Ewok village, dude. It's an eyesore, dude. An eyesore. Yeah, that's the one that sticks out to me. That's the one where I was like, no way, man. Because I remember that so much when I was a kid. Number 15, Mira Mira Snow White. Dude. This one speaks for itself. That's <laughs> whew, that's top 10 for me. Probably top 5 even. I mean, it's just ridiculous, dude. 
You know, when I was a kid, Brian, uh, my dad was friends with this dude who owned a uh, video rental store, you know, with the old VHSs and shit, like in the 80s. And he used to... He was good buddies with my dad, so he, he himself used to burn, like, all these copies. You know, he would just copy the VHS. I literally watched, like, every movie when I was a kid, you know, because I would just get them for free. So um, I would watch all the old Disney movies and shit, and Snow White, it's iconic, man. I mean, yeah, Mirror Mirror, dude, Magic Mirror is insane, dude. And some people said, well, the book had Magic Mirror. Nobody read the so book. What? None of us read the book. We all saw the movie. And by the exactly. way, again, those movies dubbed over Who the fuck read the book? Nobody. They still say mirror mirror, and the guys that dubbed it over in other languages, dude. I mean, what are they? Are they misremembering? Did they just do the whole movie off the top of their head? They didn't have a script in front of them. No, they had a script in front of them, and it said fucking mirror mirror, and that's what they said. Exactly. That's it's got like insane. the most residue. Do people just today send me like three, four different people sent me different mirror mirror residue? It's endless with mirror mirror, dude. I mean, it's endless. That's a big one. I know. Number fourteen. Sex in the City. So, I never watched Sex in the City. It wasn't my thing, obviously. But all the commercials, it was a huge show. It was a huge phenomenon. Again, it came out before there was all these Netflix and all these, you know, Amazon and Disney Prime and all the bullshit. Like, you know, it came out in a time where although we had cable, your media options were still somewhat limited. Everybody knew Sex in the City. It was everywhere. Yeah. The fact that it's always been now, apparently, sex and the city. I could vividly remember, even when they would play the reruns. Like, I lived out near Philadelphia in Jersey, and they had this one channel. It's called Philadelphia Dude, 17. You, got, you they guys are all big on this, you know? too. You guys, like, all you guys that are, like, close to me are big on this. Uh, you, Tommy, Nathan, you guys are really big on this one. I love it, dude. It's a big one for me, dude, because I remember, like I said, the commercials, they play it in, like, reruns and syndicate, and it was Sex in the City, in, 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 in. Then all of a sudden, they relaunched this new one now, and I see Sex and the City everywhere. Come to find out, apparently, it was always Sex and the City, but it wasn't. It's Sex in the City. It's all what it always was, you know. Again, it, it, this phenomenon is insane. Number 13 we already talked about is Jaws. We're going to need a bigger boat. You know, well, all of a sudden, Chief Brody's just going to sell everybody out and be a coward. You're going to need a bigger... It doesn't even make sense. Number 12, Berenst the Berenstein Bears. And then that's huge in most people's. But I was never into the books and stuff I was a kid when I was a kid. But they had a, a Sunday, a Saturday morning cartoon series that I used to watch. Yeah. Okay? I don't know if you know. Probably a lot of people, you probably know it. Um, so I never read the books or anything. But I watched, you know, the show. It was a little older. So, you know, maybe... One of my younger siblings was watching it, but it was Berenstein Bears. Brian, I was the kind of kid, dude, that I watched TV incessantly. You know, I was like, you know, kind of one of those kids where um, I would like, you know, repeat commercials and like make my dad laugh because I would like memorize a whole commercial and like repeat it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or memorize movies. I don't have, a, you know, so I have a very distinct memory of Berenstein Bears, dude. Number 11, Smokey the Bear. Smokey the Bear was huge when we were in elementary school. That was oh, like yeah, prime Smokey the Bear time. They used to, certain classes, bring out the old film projector and show us about fires, and it was always Smokey the Bear. I, don't, I can't ever once remember anybody saying Smokey Bear. It doesn't even make sense. Never heard anybody say Everybody Smokey knows. Bear. I've never heard anybody say Smithsonian Institution. I've never heard anybody say Drug Enforcement Administration. Like, ever. I'm just saying. Continue, though. <laughs> yeah. Let me, all right, let me keep going. Number 10. All right, now we're in my top 10. Ed McMahon, Publishers Clearinghouse. Okay. Same thing. I was at that age when all the envelopes were coming in, all the commercials I used to, I'm, I'm old enough to be able to remember when Johnny Carson was on before Jay Leno, you know, before Jay Leno took over. <clears throat> I remember when Johnny Carson, I used to watch Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon, but like my grandparents, you know, when I would stay up late, when I'd be sleeping over their house. Ed McMahon was iconic, dude. Think about it. He was on the Johnny Carson show. It was like the biggest show on NBC when there was only three networks. There was no fucking cable, okay? There was no internet. Everybody knew Ed McMahon. He wasn't just some chump. That's what, see, people don't remember what it was like back in the 80s, dude. There was three channels on TV, and that was it. Everybody 
knew that these stars are bigger than life back then. Ed McMahon was a big star. Hey, he's, he's from, not just some schmuck. This is uh, this is like top two Mandela effect for me. Maybe even you know right up there with the number one one. And again, he's from my hometown, dude. Like I mean, and he lived there for like twenty years, dude. Like it's just ridiculous, dude. I mean, the amount of residue on it, and there's almost nothing showing the opposite. I mean, there's not even a. When you see parodies of people saying, "When's Ed McMahon from American Family gonna come to the door?" It's always Publishers Clearinghouse, dude. <laughs> It's insane. Everybody knows it, dude. Brian, there's some of these that if you're denying them, it's like we we're saying you're denying yourself at that point. You're turning your back on your own self. You're basically denying yourself if you deny this because you're denying your memories. You're denying what makes you you, basically, and you're throwing it out, and you're saying there's a power higher than me that's going to define my reality for me. That's how sick this fucking shit is, dude. Number nine, Interview with a Vampire. When that movie came out, Tom Cruise was in the height of his fame. Uh, Brad Pitt. It was huge. It was a huge movie. I've seen it a million times, dude. Now all of a sudden, Interview with the Vampire. Here's a um, copy here, too. Hard copy here that's changed. In this house, I've shown it. I mean, no, no yeah. surprise. I mean, people that would deny would just say it's always been that way. But there is a copy that I know that's in this house that we know has changed, you know, and just along with some other things. We have things in our physical possession that we know have changed, like my Star Wars movies. Like, it, it's Karen's movie or her son's movie, but, you know, that's a Mandela effect in movies sitting right over there in the box. Yeah, dude. Think about it, dude, even linguistically. It doesn't make sense. Interview with the vampire. You wouldn't linguistically put the TH that ends the with right next to the TH that begins the the, dude. Interview with the 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 van. It doesn't even fucking roll off the tongue. Nobody would do that. No writer, no editor in their right mind, Brian, would ever title it Interview with the and vampire. We've shown the writer. You wouldn't do it. We've shown the writer of it. To be saying it interview with the vampire. I mean, it's just and, and like the Sex in the City you said earlier, the new spin-off thing, uh, the new sequel with her book is Is There Still Sex in the City? Exactly. Not Is There Still Sex and the City? I, I mean, come on, dude. Like, God. The residue's undeniable. Number eight's a big one for me. Brian, my first car I ever got was in 1993. Ford Bronco. Yeah, buddy. Okay. I loved, huh? I said, yeah, buddy. This is a huge one. I loved that car more than anything. Any possession I had, I loved that car. Brian, it was all black. It had black leather interior. My family wasn't wealthy. We're middle class, but, you know, my parents were doing decent in the 90s, and it was a used car, you know. Um, so they helped me out with it. And, you know, looking back on it, I realized my parents had cars. They liked to go skiing. So when it was time for me to get my car, when I was 17 in 1996, they bought this used Bronco for me. It was a 1993 Bronco. Little did I know, every time they wanted to go on a ski trip, why well, I didn't have my Bronco because they took it. But um, it was my favorite. I loved it, man. It was the greatest car ever. I still love those cars. My point is that I love that car so much. I know what the Ford logo looked like. <laughs> now it's got that little squiggly tail. Looks insane to me because that Ford Bronco, like that logo to me, Brian, used to be a symbol of like strength, you know, like American strength, solid steel, American steel, American built. That little squiggly end on it makes it look like feminine, dude. You know what I mean? Yeah. I do, dude. There's put, no way. I'm putting it on the screen. There's no the way, dude. Oh, yeah, I can't say. There's, there's no way, bro. That squiggle wasn't there. That pigtail on the F. It's fucking stupid. And the O like was I said, an dude, I don't remember the O being open at the top either like it is now on either of these logos. I don't remember that. But the pigtail on the F is ridiculous. And again, I've shown Henry Ford's signature. I mean, it doesn't even match his signature now. He didn't put that squiggly thing on his F. <laughs> no, it's insane, dude. It it totally changes the logo. It's like it takes that 
like I said, that solid American built, you know, idea and concept and brand, and it changes the whole thing, dude. When you're a brand, when you brand a company, your logo is everything, man. It represents your brand. It's it's the symbol of your brand. That pigtail looks insane, dude. And that pigtail wasn't there, man. No, it was my first car, like you said, with your Volvo, dude. When you have that first car and you Volkswagen, Volvo, Volkswagen, you know, you know everything about it, huh? Yeah. Volkswagen, not Volvo. Oh, Volkswagen. What did I say, Volvo? Yeah, yeah. Volkswagen. But like, anybody VW, that's had right? anybody that's had a Volvo is going through the same thing too. <laughs> same dilemma with an N. <laughs> dude, it's crazy, dude. That Ford logo, I put it as number eight on my list. That could have easily been in my top three, but. I know that logo looked like Brian. It didn't have that pigtail. No. Number seven we already talked about was Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. We talked about that earlier. Every kid, it's like we were saying, Brian, I was watching Mr. Rogers in the early 80s, but he came out before that, like in the fucking 70s, dude. Everybody, he was on PBS when I watched him here and outside I, of Philadelphia. He was on PBS. And, 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 and to make a really good point on this one, it's like I'm, I'm sure – even if I only saw, saw Star Wars, I saw Star Wars like you probably over, well over a hundred times. Um, but even if I only saw it five times, right? And it was one of my most of your favorite movies. You don't see that many times, but you might see four or five times. That's enough for me to know if C three PO had a silver leg or not. Mister Rogers, dude. I mean, not only we saw it five days a week for like a decade, which is like endless times. And on top of that, it's a song that we sang along with. I mean, it, to, to think that we're just misremembering that is is absolutely absurd to me. I want to slap the fuck out of people. Especially, here's the, here's the predicament these Mandela Effect and eyes are in. They know that they remember also it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. It's not like they remember the opposite of us. If somebody remembers the opposite as me on a Mandela Effect, I'm not going to push them on that or press them on that. Why would I? There's so many ones that they're affected by. Like... Dude, but they remember the same as us just as much as a Mandela-affected person does. If you can get them to answer honestly, and if you preface it right, they have to an answer honestly or just ignore it. I mean, you know, like the way I ask people, you know, it, they obviously have the same memories as us. Yeah, dude. Every kid saw it. Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street defined the childhood of a whole generation. Yeah. We didn't have anything else, dude. You didn't have. You might have had VHS. That was it. The only other show VCR. that there was for kids that we had was also Reading Rainbow that came along a little bit after. Yeah, Reading Rainbow, exactly. In the same way, I could sing every word to that song, every single song. <laughs> Take a know. look. It's in a book. Reading Rainbow. Yeah. I can do anything. Hey, we were gonna sing a, yeah, the dude. greatest American hero last night, right? Flying away oh God, on a wing and a prayer. Who could it be? Believe it or not, it's Believe just it me. Believe it or not, it's just me. <laughs> dude, exactly, man. He's crashing and stuff. Um, dude, the Mr. Rogers may be... It might be the number one Mandela effect in the world. Yeah. Just because of how many people saw it, like you said, every single day. It wasn't a movie you saw once or twice a year or something. You saw it every fucking day, dude. Yeah. Everybody knows it was a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Everybody knows it. I don't care. You can deny it as much as you want. And then after the Not Mandela, one person. once the Mandela Effect community was talking about it for two years already, they, they, they titled the Tom Hanks movie, It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, after the theme song, but he comes through the door and says this in this reality. I mean, it, right. It, it's so ridiculous that people could deny this one. And, and you're right, dude. This is this is right up there. In fact, I do have a list that I've made of, like, my top, you know, 20 or whatever that I use a lot. Sometimes when I go on shows, I just look over at it to have it for reference. I have Mr. Rogers sitting at number five. But if that's my personal list, if I had to consider with everybody else's and what their biggest right. ones are, it has to be, if it's not number one, uh, it would be right after Ed McMahon. It's probably number two. Cause, and I know a few people who's, who's it is their biggest. It's Ted's biggest Mandela effect. I know Dottie. It's her biggest Mandela effect. I know people who that is definitely their biggest Mandela effect. It's, it's top five for sure, maybe even number one. I agree. Yeah, dude. It's huge. Huge. Number six, we already talked about earlier. Life is like a box of chocolates. Yeah. It's what he said. Life is like a box of chocolates. He didn't say life was like a box. He said life is. Forrest Gump's another movie, dude. I saw it a million times. It just wasn't was. There's no other way to say it. Life is like a box of chocolates. 
No writer, Brian. No writer would write life was like a box of chocolates. It's an iconic. I'll put it like this, Brian. That scene would not have become iconic if it was was. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying, dude? If he said life was like a box of chocolates, it would have never took off. It's like if you changed, you know, one note in, 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 in like the greatest song ever or whatever. It wouldn't be the greatest song ever. You know, and, it would just fuck it all up, dude. While we're on this one, I have a video I did not too many months ago, short video, about this very Mandela effect, and I actually spoke in German on the video and quoted the movie, how it's said in German, and it still says life is like a box of chocolates. Just saying. Yeah. Again, the people that dubbed over the movie, just like with Mira Mira, they must have been falling for the Stave Lee style. You know? And, you know. You know what it is? It's like we said, Brian. People can't grasp the magnitude of this concept, right? It's too big for them. It means too much to relinquish yourself mentally to this Mandela effect. means too much to these people. Their, their identity is so defined by the system that it, would sh it, it shatters their paradigm. It shatters their very foundation of who they think they are. And they can't even approach it mentally. What a psychosis. What a mindset to be in where you have to avoid reality. Yeah. In an effort to preserve your, your ego and your identity. Because you can't deny these, dude. All right. I'm glad we're going through it like this, Brian, because there's people right now that most people probably heard all these, but there's people now where when you see all these presented like this, all together, you can't deny it, dude. Anyway, where am I? Number five is a big one for me, dude. Fruit Loops, okay? I used to love Fruit Loops, man. It was one of my favorite cereals, okay? Fruit was just spelled just like it normally is fruit. It was just fruit, F R U I T, loops. I remember the box. Like I said, I used to like, I was in, I'm always, I always love cereal. Cereals, you know, they're sugary shit, but when you're a kid, dude, cereals are like shit. Dude, you can get home from school, eat cereal, eat it in the morning. You could eat cereal any time. You know, you're a kid, you get the cereal out, you pour it in, pour some milk, you got a meal, dude. Fruit Loops is one of my favorites. I know it's at F-R-U-I-T. Yeah. F-O-O-T for fruit, it's a little more like, I don't know like witty in some kind of brand way, I get it. But that's not what it was. I don't care if it's witty because the O's match the loops. It wasn't that, okay? It was fruit, spelled just like it was. Fruit, F-R-U-I-T. Now it's always been F-R... That's... I can picture it on the shelves Yeah. in the shopping market. I can picture it in my cabinet. F-O-O-T looks insane. Number four is another huge one for me, man. Skechers. Ah, uh, dude. Well, I just did a video on this the other night, as I'm sure you saw, because of Kanye West and putting it all over the news. It, the headlines everywhere, residue everywhere this this past week. Continue. Okay, dude. Um, I never like bought Skechers and stuff when I was a kid. Skechers. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but like when we were young, that wasn't like a brand. It came they were, out. They came out when we, when we were. came out when maybe when we were close to 20 years old or something. Like it was. Yeah, that sounds about right. We, we, we exactly had, right. We, we basically had Nike, Reebok, Adidas, and Converse, and nothing else really. And then like Fila came out, Sketches came out, you know that type of shit. Yeah, exactly. So I remember when they came out, dude. You know, I used to go to the mall. I used to, you know, it's back in the day, Brian. So we do. We could chill at the mall. You know what I mean? You go hang out. Get get it get a get 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 an Annie Ann's fucking pretzel and some Cinnabons and stuff, you know? Yep. Yep. Um you know, you hang out and stuff, man. And I remember going by, you know, like Foot Locker or whatever and seeing oh Skechers, Skechers, man. Burned in my mind. That big the fact that it doesn't have a T anymore, that T is burned into my memory, Skechers. It looks insane without the T. It's crazy to me that that even that's why I put it so high on my list, dude, because it had a T. Look, I don't care what anybody tells me, it had a T. And that's the thing about the Mandela effect, Brian. The residue is great, right? But we have our memories. 
I that's all we really need. Yeah, I don't even need the residue. That's just to try and to show other people, and I do think it's important to wake them up to it, and we do need it. But for me and you, like, yeah. we don't need that. But I just showed the video on this the other day. Macy's still has it advertised as Skechers on their site, even though they'll sell you Skechers without a T. I'm literally going to make a call to them at some point in the next week or so and tell them I bought a pair there. I bought, I thought I bought a pair of Skechers. Why did you sell me generic sneakers and see what type of re – it's probably not going to go anywhere, but it'll make for an interesting call. Maybe I can get somebody to think about this. Maybe Axel. Some questions. I posted a picture on Facebook today that somebody posted in a Facebook group of Kroger's. Kroger's not only was the one that sold the Haas Avocados original unchanged residue that I have back here, but they also have a uh, Oscar Meyer spelled the old way displayed up on one of their displays with the M E Y E R, dude. It's like how much evidence do people want that something's actually happening? You can still go to Walmart. And buy, they will say Hass avocados and all the official displays and the stickers that are stuck on the fruit. But their POS system has not even updated yet. And you can get a printed receipt for something that's never existed that happens to match with all the Mandela Effect people. With that change, I've been telling you like six or seven years. <clears throat> well, it's funny because you just took my number one. My number one is Haas. Oh, good. Okay, let's get avocados. to that after that. Let's go in order. It's my number one. That's my number one. It's dude. huge. It's huge. My number one. It's huge. Okay. When we were kids, Brian, I never had an avocado when I was a kid. Did you? No. Right. Dude, the avocados are everywhere. But when I was a kid, I didn't have guacamole. I didn't know what the fuck. I let, I'm sure it was around. I'm sure Mexicans and stuff had it. But I didn't know what an avocado was until maybe I was like in high school or college. And I started, oh, guacamole. And I fell in love with avocados. I used to go get sushi when i first started getting a sushi and they put you know put fucking avocados on there i love mexican food make some guacamole yeah and i remember everything was haas h-a-a-s i remember my head saying what an interesting spelling for a word h-a-a-s h-a-s-s would have no significance in my mind linguistically and syntactically that would not have been a novel stimuli for me to see an h-a-s-s -S. wouldn't have focused on it so I would remember saying, wow, H-A-A-S. What an interesting way to spell a word. i never seen a word spelled like that. It's burned into my mind. That's an anchor memory for me to say, wow, Haas has two A's. It's, this is pronounced H-A-A-S. It just was a different weird way to spell it. I guess it's somebody's last name. I don't know. But, it wouldn't have stood out if it was like spelled like the word pass with an H. Like It would just be happy. Exactly. That's you the know? point I'm trying to make, dude. Syntactically, it doesn't make sense. Because it wouldn't have popped out to me exactly if it was like pass or whatever. Um, it would have never even registered for me. H-A-A-S is an anchor for me. That's why I put it as my number one because when I discovered avocados, the only avocado I ever heard of was Haas Avocado. Yep. I, th I, don't know what, I don't know if it's a brand or if it's a type of avocado. I don't know. But I just know everywhere. H-A-A-S. Yep. All the grocery stores, everything was H-A-A-S. That's why it's my number one, dude, because I remember it, which gets me to my – so now I'll, i got two more left. Yeah. So my number three, dude, talk about an anchor memory. Stouffer's, dude. Stouffer's oh. stovetop. Yeah, dude. I mean, come on, dude. The fact that, that that's never been there and it's always been craft in this reality, which is fucking absolutely absurd. Dude. In fact, I've eaten all the Stouffer's food. But the only other Stouffer's food that I ever really got into was Stouffer's French bread pizza. And I wouldn't have bought that if it wasn't for how good Stouffer's stovetop stuffing was. Like, that was absolutely by far the most famous product by a landslide. In fact, just like the Haas avocados, it was the only instant type stuffing I knew of that had a brand name. Yeah, dude. I never had Stouffer's, not that I know of. You know, maybe I was eating over somebody's house and they had it, but... I used to really love um, football when I was a kid. Remember when football was cool, Brian? I know you used to, you like sports. I know you wanted to be a sports announcer. I used to, every Sunday I would just watch all day. So particularly every just would Sunday after Sunday watching football, you know, and the commercial would come on. Stouffer stovetop stuffing. I remember it, dude. I must have saw the Stouffer stovetop commercial hundreds, if not more times, dude. Mm -hmm. This is another one, Brian. Everybody knows it was Stouffer's. Yeah. Everybody. Even all the deniers, they know it was Stouffer's. They Even all the deniers. That's why I said everybody's Mandela affected. That's why we say, like, we're the Mandela affected community. No, we're not. Everybody's Mandela affected. 
or the Mandela. We're just the people being honest with ourselves and everybody else. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, dude. Yeah. Exactly. Everybody's Mandela effect. Brian, everybody knows it was Stouffer's, dude. Everybody. And now it never existed. And number two, which would be my last one, because we already did number one, and I consider this one an anchor, Fruit of the Loom. I remember the moment, Brian, where... I was hoping this was on your list, dude, because this is like, this is... This has to be up there in like top five all time if you pulled everybody like and the amount the, the, my number the, two the reasoning behind and the way that people try and dismiss this and I'll, I want you to address all of that right here and the things that they try and say what we're mixing it up with and how absurd that is exactly please. so which is interesting Brian the thing that they say we're trying to mix it up with is exactly the thing that gave me my anchor memory so for anybody who doesn't know. The, the fruit of the loom apparently now is just a bunch of fruit. But when I remember it, when I was wearing their underwear, it wasn't just fruit. It was like there was what's called a cornucopia behind it. You know, I guess that's the loom. I don't know. But the reason it's such an anchor memory, Brian, I remember where I was, how old I was when I had the thought. Okay. It's probably like eight or nine years old. I was in my bedroom and I gotten, you know, New pa pair, you know, a new package of underwear. Right? I wore Fruit of the Loom. So you didn't have you didn't have many options back then. You had I don't even know if Hanes existed. Hanes, Hanes and Fruit of the Loom is all I remember. I'm not saying there weren't other yeah. brands, but that was it. Hanes and Fruit of the Loom, or whatever generic thing might have been around. Yeah. So I remember where I was, Brian. I was in my my bedroom, and I was opening a package. Like I said, I was a kid, dude. I was like eight or nine, dude. I was young. And remember, this is before the internet and everything. So back in the day, you were only exposed to, as far as media, what you were exposed to. It all came from the TV. But anyway, so I remember looking at the, at the logo, not only on the package, but also on my underwear. And I remember seeing the fruit and seeing the cornucopia behind it. And the reason I remember it, because I have the thought, I said, in my head, I said, oh, what is that behind the fruit? And then I remember sitting back and thinking, okay. I seen that before at Thanksgiving, and I remember head going, I think that's a cornucopia. I might not have, maybe I was, I kind of maybe didn't know the word, I was around the world, but I remember going, oh, I remember, it's, it's burned in my brain, looking at the package, and saying, oh, that thing behind the fruit, I see that at my aunt's house on Thanksgiving, and it means like plentiful, you know, I had this association with it. So I had that thought burned in, because... I didn't know what it was, so my brain, it was, again, a novel stimuli. So you remember things that are novel, new, right? If you've never seen something or it's something new, you re that's going to stick more than anything. So I remember going, okay, well, that's just associated with Thanksgiving, right? So, and I said, oh, okay, well, all right, yeah, that's what it means. So it's showing that the fruit is coming like a plentiful, right, whatever. Well, apparently now that's what they use to try to sell us and say, or try to deny the deniers will say, well, you just remember because it's from Thanksgiving and it's a cornucopia. Well, okay. But I just showed right now how that reference actually was my anchor memory because I associated those two things myself mm -hmm. back in the mid 80s when I was eight years old. And, and me, you know myself, I mean? myself, I've never seen a cornucopia ever in real life, and I know it was on the underwear. And also, there's people in countries that certainly don't fucking celebrate Thanksgiving um, that have had that product and know that there's a fucking cornucopia on the fruit of the loom. I mean, it's ridiculous to deny that one. I mean, God. Yeah, dude. It's huge. So, yeah, man. And, and I, I could have mixed this list, but I tried to put this list is like my biggest effects, you know? Yeah, my dude. biggest ones. Yeah. 